بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله ما بعد جزاكم الله خيرا for um, coming today to, to listen to a few words inshallah the topic today is Islamic education in the home principles and strategies personally I like to be very structured in my approach so inshallah today I'm going to be talking about five main things number one Mindset, number two, environment, number three, prioritization, number four, pitfalls, and number five, resources. So inshallah, my talk will go through these five main points and delve into each point, uh, and inshallah, we can give it justice. The first question we must ask ourselves when it comes to Islamic education is we need to rectify our, our mindset. What is the goal? that we are trying to achieve with Islamic education in the home. What is the goal? Some may think the goal is to make all the children hufal. Perhaps that's the goal. Some may believe the goal is to make all the children fluent in the Arabic language. Some may believe the goal is to make all the children become mashayikh or ulama. The goal changes between family and family. But is this the goal we should be striving for? Firstly, what I've just mentioned already about Hifl and Arabic and becoming you know, a scholar, these are all means to achieve a greater goal. They are not the goal themselves. Which means, if your son or if my son or my daughter, of our sons or our daughters, don't become Hafil or Sheikh or fluent in Arabic, it doesn't mean it's a failed job. It does not mean it's a failed job. And that's very important to note because we focus a lot on the goal or on the specific objective instead of what should we, instead of what we should actually focus on. So how can we find out what the goals of Islamic education should be in the home? We look to the Quran and in the Quran, there is a passage between a father and a son. Does anyone know which passage I'm referring to? Close. Luqman, excellent. In this passage between Luqman and his son, it highlights six main aspects or, or goals that we should strive for when it comes to educating our children. Number one, لا تشرك بالله إن شرك لظلم عظيم. First is knowing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acting accordingly. If our children, no matter what what years, many years of education we put them through and a lot of effort and time and money, if at the end of it all, they are not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is actually a failed project. Even if they are hafil, even if they're hafil, if they don't have the connection to Allah, they don't fear Allah when they're alone or with their friends, away from your sight, then that's a failed project. If no matter how much resources and books you have at home and they've read and they're well read and they attend courses, if they don't have the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that's a failed project. Not only does Luqman say, لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم. He says afterwards, يا بني, إنها إن تكو مثقال حبة من خردل فتكون في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير. Oh my beloved son. If there was a very, very small seed, and this seed was in you know, a giant boulder, or this seed was placed somewhere you know, in the skies, or it's dug deep somewhere on the earth, anywhere on the earth. Imagine how vast the earth is. Yet to be Allah, Allah can bring out that seed from that location. Meaning, look at the power and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let that affect you. In Allah latifun khabir. In Allah, indeed Allah is subtle and all aware. See how he in, sort of instills this taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his child? That's the second point. So the first one is connection with Allah. Second is taqwa of Allah. That imagine now this child has received this advice from his father. Will he think about doing something sinful or haram when his parents aren't there, he would have to think very deeply or it'd have to be a big mistake. Meaning the process or the internalization should be so strong 
that this is something very, very, very unlikely or far-fetched for the son or daughter to commit a sin. Because they are so aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just about sins, even about dealing with um, calamities and things not working out their way and living in difficult times, maybe some poverty. Someone passes away in the family. How do they deal with all this? Imagine they have in their knowledge, yet to be Allah. Allah can bring forth a small seed from anywhere. Then they know Allah can bring ease from any hardship. Then they know Allah SWT can bring success from any failure. So when they have that mindset, then that is a successful project. That is successful education. This, the next advice he gives his son, Ya Bunayya aqim salah Oh my beloved son, establish the prayer. And that is, you could say, the third goal we are trying to achieve with Islamic education in the home. If our sons and our daughters are, neg you say, neglectful about their prayers or they pray them very quickly or they pray them very late, then that is a failed project. That is a failed project. But if they are adherent to establishing the prayer with its sunan and its arkad and its fiqh and its internal states, the khushur and so on, then that is a successful project. So the salah is a good indicator as to the success of the Islamic education in the house. The salah is good, even if they know only if 10 surah. If the salah is solid, that's very good. And even if they're hafil, but the salah is very haphazard, then this is, there's a problem in the Islamic education. Aqimi salata, next one. Wa'mur bil ma'roofi wanha anil munkar. That's the fourth goal of Islamic education is to build them as du'at, enjoining good, forbidding evil. And this is something that requires, you could say, transferring responsibility to the, to the child. What does this mean? What do I mean by transferring responsibility? Commonly, from my experience um, teaching youth and dealing with practicing families, there, is a lot, there are a lot of orders and commands but there isn't any transfer responsibility. Do this, then do this. Do this, this is what's going to happen. Don't do this. You need to do this. You need to... But the child has no agency, has no self-direction. You want to build a child that can take those commands, is in, can internalize those commands and also preach them. Also be an agent of changing others. So you'll find if, if a child can take all the information that they're receiving and all the commands, and prohibitions, internalize them, implement them, and can then impact others through it, that's a successful child. That is a successful, that is successful education. So many times we limit their independence and their responsibility and their personality. So oh, if, for example, the child likes to give people advice, and they do it politely. They say, don't, don't, don't give too much advice, don't talk too much, you're talking too much. Those kids, if they tell their parents that you, you said this, they're going to get upset and all this. So you limit their personality. So this child could be in a phenomenal day, but you, we limit their personality. So they don't say anything. They stay quiet. They have no personality. And if, something does some, if anyone does anything wrong, don't, don't upset the status quo. Don't say anything. Just stay silent and ignore. So we don't look bad and you know, we don't make others look bad. No, no, no. That should be encouraged as long as it's done with akhlaq and manners and so on. So that it is good actually that, for example, a child does say, you know, I saw this and I, and I gave them advice. I said something to them. That's something that should be encouraged. Should be encouraged. Um, not something that should be shunned and looked down upon. And that's very, very important. Being, you know, practicing or from a practicing family, it's important that they become the beacons of da'wah in the future for the next generation, for their generation, not that they are limited. Then the passage continues, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أصابك. And you could, we could title this fifth goal as internal actions of the heart, being patient upon what befalls you. So Luqman alayhi salam, or Luqman al-Hakim, depending which opinion you take, the fifth goal that he is trying to achieve or impart in his son is rectifying the heart. So all the other actions, yes, taqwa is linked to that. Establishing prayer is a physical action, enjoining good, forbidding evil, are physical actions, but rectifying the heart. Because this, when you're involved in da'wah, 
and you want to establish prayer and you want to have taqwa and you want to fear Allah and so on, they will be calamities and tests that come your way. So be prepared for these tests. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Be patient about what's going to be for you. And this is this link between the a'mal and the ilm and sabr is in many places in the Quran. Like for example, Surah Al Asr, illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sabr is linked to, you know, advising each other to the truth. It's linked to doing good deeds. It's linked to growing your iman with knowledge. That's the fifth goal. The sixth goal mentioned in the passage. وَلَا تُصَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَ Don't turn your cheek away arrogantly and don't walk on the earth proud. We could summarize these actions as akhlaq, building the akhlaq of the child. Yep. And you see the akhlaq that is mentioned here are actually specific points. Meaning even the way you walk, even the way you turn your face, this is all accounted for. And this is all, that, all of this should be corrected and rectified by the parents. And this is part of the education. So don't just think it's about knowledge or information. You know, my son or my daughter, they know so much. Look at their face, how they turn it. Look at the way they look, at, look towards others. Do they look down upon them? And you, you, if you just observe a class, you can tell who has an, an ego problem. So for example, I sometimes see this from the students. Some from the, you could say, beginner students, they make a silly mistake or they don't know the surah, surah tateen. So the ones that have memorized more, they'll have it, they'll make, they might scoff. I say, what? Look at this guy, he doesn't know this surah, he doesn't know this tajweed rule. That scoff is a problem. That scoff comes from somewhere and that needs to be rectified. Even though the child didn't say anything. But the attitude, is wrong. The attitude is wrong. And that's very, very important to rectify. So the six goals in summary, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at-taqwa, establishing the prayer, enjoining good and forbidding evil, internal action of the heart, and akhlaq. Six goals for Islamic education in the home. The next question we must answer under mindset is whose responsibility is Islamic education? Whose responsibility is it? Unfortunately, the way that we are heading towards, a lot of parents are shifting the responsibility and outsourcing it to others. So for example, there will be kids that come to the Quran classes, they don't know how to read anything, not a single Arabic letter. The parents can read, fine. Sometimes the parents are actually, they have memorized many ajza and they read the Quran nicely. So you wonder, why are you bringing your child to us? Perhaps you know more than us. But you spend more time with the child. You should be teaching the child at least the fundamentals. If there, is, if there are areas that you do not have the expertise or the knowledge to teach your children and then you outsource it, that's fine. That's a fair point. But Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, why, why is a Quran teacher teaching this to your child? And there's, there are reasons why this is problematic. It is very important that the parents need to be involved. Why? Number one, they have to lead by example. If you keep outsourcing everything to the madrasa, or the Quran school, or the holiday programs, and so on, then what does the child see? He sees a discrepancy between what my father and mother want me to do and what they actually do. They want me to become this amazing hafil or scholar, but I've never seen mum and dad read Quran except in Ramadan. I've never seen them seek any knowledge. They don't even know any Arabic. They don't even know what idgham is. And they want me to sit through this exam, tedious, getting taught every Saturday, one and a half hours for 40 weeks, learning this orange book. But my dad is, or mom have never opened an or this orange book before. They don't know what it's about. When they see that discrepancy, they start developing a sort of dislike and distaste towards their parents. And some may even start to believe their parents are hypocritical. And that affects the relationship between the parent and the child immensely. Immensely. So many times, yeah, a parent will come up to me with their son. I'll say son because I don't do with sisters, obviously. And he say, can he speak to my son? The parent's excited. The son is not excited to speak to me. He has a grim look in his face. And I know there's a discrepancy between the two. 
I'm like, what am I going to say to the son? I don't know the son. I don't, I've never, never met him before. There's no magical word that can sprinkle and that said he's going to be a good son all of a sudden. There's years of history between the father and son and any da'i or any ustad or anyone in the da'i can't, can't fix that in minutes or even days. You have to lead by example. Very, very important. You have to lead by example. Number two, you have to be emotionally connected to your children. Have you, have you, if you realize I'm talking about the two previous topics, leading by example two weeks ago and emotionally connect, engaging with your children. So it cannot be like a set of orders sent by the king of the army to the soldiers. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do this. Then there is no connection. When the child does not love what they're doing, or does not see any true benefit in what they're doing, they will always have an attitude problem towards learning. They have to be emotionally connected, and that starts from the parents. When they see their parents, for example, growing up, that they pray and they do the adhkar of the salah and they love telling stories of the prophets, these things, they, the kids remember it. The kids remember it, and they, this makes them yearn for that knowledge. But if there's an emotional disconnect between what the parents want the child to do and what the child needs to do, then there's going to be a lot of friction, a lot of problems. Another important point is if when the parents outsource, they outsource all the education, they themselves miss out on immense rewards. For example, teaching your child Surah Al-Fatiha is something I think every parent should, should do and never ever outsource. If you can recite it correctly, of course. Why? Because when they learn Surah Al-Fatiha, they'll read it at least 17 times a day. 365 days of the year, and if they live long, may Allah grant all of us long lives full of good deeds, 70, 80 years, you can do the maths. You are outsourcing that to a teacher when you can do it yourself. Reading, ha ha learning how to read Quran, even if your tajweed is not the best, at least you can help them recognize the letters and put it together. If you want to improve the makharij and your makharij isn't good, that's fine. You can, then you can outsource. But from day one, why outsourcing? You can read, you can read the Quran. You can read the suwar don't outsource from day one if you can't read that's a different story but if you can read then you should be involved in teaching them how to read um, also knowing about Allah surely all of us here know some names of Allah some story from the seerah from the prophet from the prophet السلام, from Umar al-Khattab you know some short story share that with your children why are you outsourcing everything because when you outsource everything then there is going to be that missing emotional connection. Also, we must remember that most of the time is spent with the parents, not the teacher. So even if I, I'll give you an example. If your son or daughter was to attend every single education program at MIA, it will total 10 hours maybe in the week. That's it. They attend Quran college every three times a week and madrasa on Saturday and every next gen, 10 hours. That's it, max. Where are the 158 hours of the week going? The rest of the 158 hours. Where are they going? Okay, they go to school 40 hours. They're still on the 118 hours to account for. They sleep 8 hours a day. 56 hours. Okay, we minus that. It's 52 hours left. Or 62 hours left, sorry. 62 hours they're with you at home. With the parents at home. So there are always going to be moments to teach the children, educate them, give them tarbiya. 62 hours compared to 10. And in the 10 hours, do you think they get one on one time? No, it would be 20, 30 students. But 62 hours with people, meaning the mum and dad, people that can only do that job. You cannot outsource being a mother or a father. You can, teacher is bad, you can replace the teacher with another teacher. Malkas is bad, change the malkas. But the mother or father, you cannot change them. So 62 hours a week with the parents for years, up to 18 years. Those are important. Those are crucial moments. What are we teaching our children in those moments? The calamity happens. Gaza. Do we tell them, talk to them about, you know, what the history behind it? What's our position towards it? How should we support our brothers and sisters there? Or do we just, we're scrolling and they're scrolling. And there's no connection. So it's very important to capitalize on those moments and give them tarbiyah. One of the mashayikh said there's a difference between tarbiyah and ta'aleem. He said, a ta'aleem is to teach your children 
how to pray. And at-tarbiya is to cuddle them after the prayer and teach them a hadith or a story or reward them for it. Does it make sense, the difference between the two? So tarbiya, he, he describes it as in that emotional engagement. And ta'alim is you teach them the fiqh of salah, you know, this is a rukun and fi misa raka'i yusuju sahu and so on. But tarbiya are those special moments that only you can have with your child. The teacher is not going to cuddle them and, and teach them a story. There's 20 other students to worry about. But only you can, as a parent, give them that tarbiya. So that sums up mindset. The next sort of main point I would like to cover is environment. There must be an environment of positivity and encouragement, not an environment of negativity and disapproval. And this is very, very common. And I'll explain um, later on why that happens. If we look at the Salaf, they, they lived this concept of positivity and encouragement. You know, the Salaf, it is narrated that they would give a dinar to their child for every hadith they memorized. Every hadith, a gold dinar to the child. Why, why give the dinar? Is it, you might say you know, the child might be insincere and so on. The idea behind it is to build a habit. Once they reach the age of puberty, they memorize maybe a thousand hadith. In the, it's in their mind, it's in their conscious, they think about it. Now they're just used to it. Memorizing one hadith a day is part of my everyday life. So let's see the positivity and encouragement that they're instilling. Al-Bukhari said about his teacher, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, that Ishaq ibn Rahawai said to him, you know, why don't you gather a book that compiles or that sort of collects all the most authentic hadith? So Bukhari said, that's a good idea. He's 16 years old at that time. So he spent the next 16 years gathering the hadith for Sahih al-Bukhari. And, you know, criticizing and, and you know, um, looking at the narrations and finding which one will be dis discarded and which will be included. 16 years. Why? Because his teacher said something nice to him. So I see potential in you. Why don't you do this project? al dhahabi also a big scholar of Islam, one of Ibn Taymiyyah's students. One of his teachers said to him, your handwriting is like the handwriting of the muhaddithin. Also just praise his handwriting. He said, these words affected me. So I became a muhaddith. Simple things that, that, that can be said to the child that can change their life forever. So there has to be a, a, an environment, a culture of positivity and encouragement. But what do we do? Unfortunately, we are very critical. You didn't memorize one page today. There's problems. Why didn't you do this one page? You're supposed to do one page every day. Why did this happen and not this happen? It's always about what you, do, what you did wrong. So when the child grows up in that environment, then they may not want to seek knowledge later or learn about Dean later. Also, a key component of the environment is to build habits for the child. And this is where leading by example, again, is very, very important. You want to create systems in your house that enable and promote Islamic education. So for example, you have a room, if you, if you have the space, you have a room, or even a, a subsection of your living room, whatever it is, where it's just books, and then when they come to this area, this is where they're going to read. For something very simple, it's just a mind thing. So then they respect that area and they, they take knowledge seriously in that area. For example, another example would be, you have a little area in your house where the prayer mats are out, and this is where you pray, sunan or qiyamul layl or witr, whatever it is. So the child knows. This way, you smile, you see little children, see one year old, they'll come and do sujood there. What, why? We taught him to do sujood. No, you didn't say, and this is how you do sujood. Because no. why? I've seen people pray there on this prayer mat. They don't pray outside the prayer mat, if you've noticed. They don't pray outside the prayer mat. When they stand on the prayer mat, then they go for the sujood. This is just them learning from the habits of people in the family. The same thing can be done. So for example, building a habit of adhkar after the salah or sunan, of you know, learning, seeking knowledge. Maybe there's a time, you know, when I was younger, I had a, we had a family friend, subhanAllah, the uncle, every, after every salah, he get the salihin, and he teaches children one hadith. Every salah. Incredible stuff. But imagine the children after, maybe in the beginning they get a bit annoyed or bored, but after, you know, two months, this is part of their life now. If the hadith doesn't happen, they're like, is that okay? Is it must be very busy? Is something happened? Because this is, becomes part of the system they have in the house. So it's very important to have these systems. 
Another important point about environment is quality and not quantity. So, so to remember that, that, that when we focus on internal transformation of the child, and we focus on the quality of internal transformation, then we don't have to worry about the details. Let me explain what I mean by this. And I've seen this from experience from Shabab that have grown up and grown you know, beyond the teenage years. So for example, there will be parents that insist and force their children to become hafil at a young age and to the dislike of the, par- of the child. So they'll be forced to go full-time hafil, draining eight hours a day and so on. Unfortunately, sadly, some of these children, when they finish their hafil, they don't revise it ever. Or they, they, they revise it very haphazardly or they don't take it seriously anymore. Because now they've achieved the goal, the tick. The job is done. Parents are off my back. Often they just they can now say the their son's half of. <laughs> Let's see, the tick is done. So revision is just like a side thing, and the children don't take it seriously. A lot of them forget the Quran. Sadly, let's compare that to another scenario, which is internal transformation, which is you you impart in your children loving the Quran and learning about it and respecting it, and you know. Having that connection with it. Even the early memories, Juz Amma, but the, they, their, their memory of the Quran is a good and happy memory. It's a positive experience. So you focus on that internal transformation. A lot of the brothers I see that memorize later, they reflect back on that internal experience they had. You know, I loved memorizing the Quran. I loved my Quran class. I loved my Quran teacher when I was young. So now that I have the resources or ha- I, now I'm responsible for myself, I actually want to memorize Quran now. So they'll end up doing what the parents wouldn't, you know, the other set of parents wanted their children to do at a later time, which is fine, but it is much more powerful. Why? Because it is from themselves, not because of force. I hope that makes sense. Um, because when they're not internally transformed, as soon as you stop the education or the tarbiyah, at home or sending them to the masjid and so on, they will stop. But if they're internally transformed, then they will go, keep going themselves. They will go, once they get their peace, they will come to the masjid themselves. They want to learn, they want to engage, they want to be part of the da'wah. Why? Because there was internal transformation. There's also practical measures that we can put in place to improve the environment. So I mentioned the example of books earlier. Another one is car rides car ride. So for example, every time you're in the car, you play a series, a series of lectures that are engaging, obviously has to be appropriate for the age group. You cannot be, give them something boring that's intellectually stimulating for you, but not for them. Um, or could be Quran. I have a story with my nephews um, when they were very young. Um, one of my oldest nephew was memorizing Juz Amma. He was maybe six, seven years old. So we used to have Minshawi repeat Juz Amma just in the car. Now, as wherever we go, it's just repeating from an nabat to an nas. So then, I think, if I remember correctly, I was listening to uh, to my nephew read Surat Al Humaz or something, Al Adiyat, and he got stuck. Then his three year old brother, three years old, he corrected him. He has memorized anything. We haven't taught taught him to open Mus'haf or anything. He doesn't know how to read. Doesn't anything. But why? He's just sitting in the car listening all these times. Even he knows the su- surah now. Three years old. So it's just the environment. If you create that environment, then the children can pick up on all, a lot of these things. Also, videos is another example. So putting videos on the laptop, on the TV, and educational videos. They remember a lot of these things um, when they grow up. The third main point is prioritization. So what should we prioritize when it comes to Islamic education? As I've mentioned earlier, there is a big emphasis on specific goals, which are often the means, not the main goals. We discuss the main goals, the six main goals. Hifl and Arabic and, you know, studying a particular book. These are all means to achieving that goal. So what should be prioritized? It really depends on the age group of, of the children. But in summary... You could say there are main um, principles that apply across the board. Number one is connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and internal action of the heart. So having discussions about, you know, why we trust in Allah, 
is Al-Hakim and Al-Latif and Al-Rahman is merciful. This is very, very empowering, very, very empowering for the, for the child. The next, you could say, core principle, or that's common across the board, is building the Sunan. So the, you could say, the prophetic day. What does the prophetic day look like? What does Prophet do? And the next point, understanding why he did these things. So for example, you could tell them, you need to do the Athkar, and do the Athkar, but once they read the Athkar and they understand its meanings, it's very, very powerful. And the next point is, or you could say, across the board, something that's very important to prioritize, is as obligations come up, they should learn these obligations before they become, they become obligate on the person. So for example, salah should be, not when I can when I wait until they reach the age of puberty, then no, it must be a habit built from before. Hijab must be a habit built from before, and so on. Fasting must be a habit built from before. So these things must be prioritized, these obligations, but not just c- commanding them to do the obligations, but rather focusing on that internal component. The internal component is very, very powerful and very important. Number four, the fourth main point. What are the pitfalls that we can fall into and the problems that we can fall into when it comes to Islamic education? So as I mentioned earlier, being fixated on what should be the means. Number two, setting a timeline for a goal and then applying a lot of pressure to achieve that goal. So for example, I'll use the example of Hifad because I deal with a lot of this. Parent will come, I need my son or my daughter to finish Hifad in three years. Why? My question is why? The, the child's eight years old. <laughs> the little kid, little child. Eight. Why? Because, you know, they have a, a whole, the whole life planned out for that child, which is good. But it can be a bit too much pressure. Because by 11, he's going to join school again. He's going to finish homeschooling. And I need him to get into this school because this school, you get good ATAR. And I need him to do medicine. Because medicine is a good career. So... <laughs> and so on and so forth. I have a friend who's a doctor right now. He spent 13 years doing Hifl. He went, he started in kindergarten and finished in year 12. Never went full-time. And he went to one of the top selective schools in, in the state. He's eight hours, nine, nine plus. And he, you know, got into medicine first go. You'd have to pressure the child to finish Hifl in three years. 13 years. 13 years you do Three, two, three ajza a year. How easy is that? How nice is that? And they can finish. No problem. So what we do is we put these very, very tough expectations. And that makes it very hard for the child. Um, and then also it leads them to resenting the Quran and Hifl and Deen and so on. Another pitfall is comparisons. Comparisons. So I've seen this myself amongst when I talk to parents or even students, you know, so-and-so finished in three years. Why aren't you smart enough to finish in three years? <laughs> yeah? Why are you taking so long? So long? They or so-and-so learned Arabic in X amount of time or they did a completed course Y in Z amount of time. Why does it take you so long to do it? This is detrimental to the child. Detrimental. This destroys the self-esteem of the child. It's the worst thing you can do. Worst thing. Every student learns in their own pace. I've had students, um, or we've had students in the, in the Quran college, you know, the, they were moving at one juz a year. And suddenly, again, internal transformation, they memorize five juz a year. It's okay. It's fine. You know, when, uh, we, when Quran college started, the imams you see, most of them were on juz tabarak, juz amma. Most of them. When they first started. It's eight years ago. Not long ago. And subhanAllah, it, something happened. They were interested, became interested. Was the Sheikh Abu Red is a very positive person. A lot of encouragement. SubhanAllah, they were just one after the other. They just started finishing. Imagine we, we told them eight years ago. Just, she's still in just about it. Look at all this Quran college. You're graduating. Hufad. What are we doing? You're all failures. You're all, you know, you're not doing, doing good enough. If we told them that, they will never finish. Very hard for them to finish. But when you push and you're positive and you encourage, then you can see the results, inshallah. Especially, again, if they want to do it from themselves. So comparisons is a big, big destroyer of good work that you can do for your child. The next is high expectations. So happiness, happiness is having low expectations 
and also being realistic. That's the key to happiness. But what, what do we do? Unfortunately, we earmark the children that are going to be something from before. So many times, this one's going to be, you know, in this profession, and this one's going to be in that profession, and this one's going to be the alim, and this one's going to be the hafiz. Then we have immense expectation on the child. So they may be a bit slow, they're not, you know, it's, they're not catching on in class fast enough. So why? What's wrong with you? Why can't you do it? Again, all of this is us imposing all the barriers that the child faces. It's us. It's not the child. The child is a blank slate. The child is what you tell them they are. You tell the child you're smart, you're smart, you're smart. You'll believe he's smart. You tell the child you're, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb. They'll believe they're dumb. It's that simple. It's that simple. We, everything that the child believes about itself comes from the people around them. The child is simple and pure. They don't know any better. So we have these very high expectations. They must finish by X amount of time. They must be like this. They must be like that. And then the reality is very different. And then we become very upset because there's so much discrepancy. We must understand, my brothers and sisters, we live in Australia, Sydney, Australia. You cannot watch a video of an Egyptian child who's saying Qur'at by age 10 and then think your child is going to do the same. It's very hard. The environment there is you walk in the street, people are reading Qur'an. That's the environment. It's a different environment. You cannot compare. Here, to stay away from, you know, haram on social media or zina, this is the real test here. They're not growing up in Masjid Nabawi. Like, I'm sorry to say it, but we don't understand this. We're like, oh, you know, I, look at this child. This, we watch the video and, and you might call your son and say, look at this, look at this boy. Look how good he is. Why can't you be like this? That child has different circumstances. We must understand that. If your child does the basics well and he stays away from the major sins and you know, he's not involved on social media. He's not a big gamer wasting his time and doing... You're doing a great job. Alhamdulillah, you're doing a fantastic job. Because the environment is very difficult. Sometimes I, I, I don't realize how good, alhamdulillah, the shabab that comes to my art until I see... Sometimes I give khutbah at schools or I talk to the students and I see what the average student is like. Then I'm like, you know what? Yeah, boys, they get a bit naughty here and there, but alhamdulillah, they're much, much better than the average student. Much better. So you must put everything into perspective. You might think, oh, you know, this is what I want my son or daughter to be like. And, you know, so far from my expectation. But you must be real. For, same thing applies to the sisters. So, for example, you know, you might have expectation. They must wear jilbab or must wear niqab by, you know, by the time they're 18. All I might say to you is go to any Islamic school and see for yourself how the sisters are dressed. Then you'll be very grateful. If your daughter wears a abaya and just wears like a hijab, you'd be very grateful because you realize what is the standard and they're ahead of the standard. Yes, you can encourage and expect better, inshallah, and push them in a positive way. But remember what the, what the average Muslim is like. Remember that and where you live and what resources you have available. Very um, clear example would be, you know, I memorized a lot of Quran overseas. Overseas, the class is free for Qur'an. It's every weekday. At the masjid, the local, every local masjid has a hifz halaqa. From Asr to Maghrib, there's no cost. There's no travel time. There's no traffic. You just walk. The teacher's super qualified. Azhar, Medina graduate. He's half of There, if, it's, if you don't become half of there after attending the halaqa for years, and there's something wrong with you. Like, everything is there in your fingertips. Compare that to here, it's three times a week, you know, student-teacher ratios, you know, one teacher, 20 students, and then the classes are short, one half hours, and there's behavior issues, and you have to deal with that, and the teachers have so many responsibilities, and you have to give them holidays, because then they get upset, well, where are my holidays? And they have to, you have to drop them, the parking in Macquarie Street so hard, and it's traffic on the way there, if they start at six o'clock, you get stuck in traffic, there's so many things to worry about. So we must recognize our limitations and what we can achieve living in Australia, in Sydney. Yes, we try our best. But it's very different to, for example, overseas or what other children might have access to. Um, another pitfall is, which I've mentioned a few times now, is not leading by example. I won't delve into that as I, because I've already mentioned about it. And also not winning their hearts. Remember, we need to win their hearts. It's not about how much information they know. It's about winning their hearts. Because once you do that, 
it opens the doors for them to explore and learn and you know read themselves or attend lectures themselves and so on but if you always um, focus on the information being transferred and that's the main goal then the heart won't be won over the last main point uh, is about resources um, I divided this into a few things so number one is books there are now many books that are tailored for children um, in the English language that are very, very beneficial for education. There's even, for example, Tafsir for Children. There's a book called Tafsir for Children by Dr. Mustafa Al-Khattab. It's got colors and pictures and it's, it simplifies the meaning of the ayah. And he's even got a Quranic dictionary again with pictures and goes to the root letter of each word. Very, very useful. There's also books like, for example, The Simple Seerah by Asim Khan from the UK. It's like the seerah, but in a story mode that's you know, palatable for the child to read and learn about. There are so many resources out there, just in books. Then there's courses. So for example, if you have teenage children, Sapiens Institute has so many courses on their website about LGBTQ, about you know, atheism, about da'wah, about secularism. But all the things that will affect them in today's life free course out there with videos and quizzes and everything then there's also for example there's IAU Islamic it's called International Open University I don't think resources are a problem but what's the sort of the main take home message about resources it's about effective use of the resources and tailoring it for the learner so the, the, I see two main issues that often happen is again the resources are just a, a, a command like here do this there has to be that engagement Maybe you do the course with the with your child. You'll learn a few things. It's fine. Even if you don't learn, if you already know it, it's revision. It doesn't hurt. And telling it to the child. So for example, it's very the the course is very high level beyond the child's capability. And why does this happen? Because we have high expectation of the child. You should know this already. You should be studying this high level book or this text. Why why don't you understand it? No, it should be tailored and you should hold the child by their hand figuratively and take them up the levels of knowledge. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about the specific books they study. Rather, it's about the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love for the deen. So resources are plenty, plenty online. It's just tapping into them and being involved with them to learn and to go through those resources. Um, there's also, I've written here, Saturday school. So, for example, at, at the Madrasa here, we, we try and, update and modify the curriculum as the times change and as the students you could say um capacity and their needs change so there's something and there's a lot of work actually happening internationally for this as well so we take benefit from you know other organizations that have been they're already ahead of the game they're already planning ahead on how to develop engaging resources for for students so it's important you just have to research and look into it you will find so many programs, alhamdulillah. And if, if affordability is a concern, there are many free programs as well. But just to summarize quickly, I covered five main points. Number one, the mindset and the goals of Islamic education as taken from the passage of uh, Luqman with his son. Number two, the environment. Number three, what should be prioritized. Number four, the common pitfalls. And number five, the resources we can tap into to um, sort of solidify the Islamic education we provide at home. Um, I hope that this was of benefit to, to us all here. Um, Subhanakum hamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.